Okay, about two weeks ago, I was sat down and I was just about to watch some wrestling when I thought to myself, do you know what, I don't really want to watch the current products anymore. TNA, WWE and even ROH, they're not doing it for me anymore. Just the current wrestling products, for some reason, just isn't entertaining me, it isn't exciting me. So I thought, I'd go back and I'd watch WCW from 1996 onwards up until its ending days in 2001. So I've started now, I started with... Um, I think it's June, or maybe, no, May, I think it's May 1996, and it's the day that Scott Hall first appeared in WCW, and this is the first pay-per-view I've come to, watching it all in chronological order, The Great American Bash 1996, and I thought, if I'm going to watch a pay-per-view, I might as well review it for all the people on YouTube who uh, watch my videos, who enjoy my videos, I thought I'd review it for people who want to hear about WCW as well, so, yeah, if you don't want to hear about WCW, um, I apologise, I will be doing these videos, but you don't have to watch them, I suppose, so, yeah. Let's get straight into it. Um, the Stein Brothers in the first match faced off against Fire and Ice. Ice was Ice Train and Fire was Scott Flash Not, and who knows where he got the name Fire from. Probably this shitty little booking idea in the back. Um, yeah, um, pretty rubbish match. Nothing really to nothing to really talk about in this. Um, but there's really no backstory to the match either. That the Stein Brothers were feuding with a Luger and Sting at the time. Uh, they were like both tag teams and they were both friends. Luger and Sting were the tag team champions. The Steiners were like rated as the best tag team in the world back then, in my opinion, anyway. And I think that's what even said on the thing. Um, nothing, nothing so much to really say about it. Like I just said, um, the ending was botched. I think it was Ice Train and Scott Steiner both botched it. It was supposed to be a Frankenstein and it was sort of a weird sort of head scissors rather than a full Hurricane Runner, full. Frankensteiner. It was rubbish. Uh, you can tell by my enthusiasm whilst talking about it. I've got nothing good to say about it. The Steiners were the highlight of the match. The Steiners both were um, highly competent in the ring as they were back then. Um, very good wrestlers. But Fire and Ice just let it down really. And I did. I do actually like Scott Norton. And I think Scott Norton's a decent worker. But Ice Train just absolutely wank. Uh, so yeah. Uh, pretty rubbish match to start it off. Then we had Conan defending his United States title against El Gato. Now, there's one thing that on commentary, what was he called? <coughs> Larry Zabisco. Larry Zabisco said, Oh, I don't think these two guys should be even fighting for the United States Championship because they don't have a green card. And I thought that's a bit of a racist thing to say as an English wrestling fan watching it. That might as well say, Oh, you're an English person, shouldn't you even be watching an American title match? So maybe you'd not care about the title as much, if I'm being honest. I was like, Hmm. You're supposed to be showing that you've got all the best wrestlers from all around the world fighting, but then you're just going to say, no, it's just for Americans only. Larry Zabisco, he just... That was a, one of a number of uh, commentary, uh, fatal errors, in my opinion, during this entire card. Dusty Rhodes is horrible on commentary throughout. And, um... Yeah, in fact, I don't know if that was said on this show by Larry Zabisco or on a night show, like, just before it, but, yeah, that was said. I remember thinking, like, really, are you actually going to say that? Rubbish. But yeah, it was a decent match. Conan was jacked. I forgot how big and how good Conan looked, but I mean, Conan looks like a legitimate superstar. He looked like a Latino version of uh, Goldberg, if I'm being honest. He looks really good. Um, El Gato, I don't know. I've not got much to say about him. They said he was from North Amer uh, South America, even, and I don't know anything about him. This is the first time I've ever heard of him, even. And he did alright. This was a very good match, a very good technical match, and um, Conan got the win. Defended, successfully defended the United States title. Um, as a lot of people might know at the time, he was Conan was the guy bringing in a lot of the Mexican guys from Mexico into the company, so he had a high role and he was a proper superstar in Mexico at the time. So WCW brought him over. Sort of like Sin Cara now, WCW brought him in. WCW did that with Conan, but they gave him the United States title. They let him defend it on pay per views, having him win. And yeah, I don't think he was working night shows, he was just coming in for the odd shows. Here we go, next up, DDP beat Buff, Marcus Buff Bagwell in an awful match, both guys were green again, not much backstory to tell you for the match, it was just happened, um, just remember thinking while I was watching it, this is really rubbish, and they both did get a lot better in their time at WCW, especially DDP, but in this match they were both horrible, they were both green, they were botching moves, they were like, being, like making little mistakes, and it was just really annoying to watch, um, not good at all. Uh, next up, Dean Malenko versus Rey Mysterio Jr. for the Cruiserweight title. Now, I do fit believe that it was Rey, this was Rey Mysterio's debut match, if I remember correctly. Because I remember reading it in his book like a few days ago. If you've not seen my book review of Rey Mysterio's book, go ahead and watch it. It's on my channel. Um, I recommend watching it. Or I recommend watching all my videos, of course, because they're my videos. Of course I'm going to say that. I'm not going to say they're rubbish, am I? 
Whatever. Um, yeah, Rey Mysterio and Malenko put on a very good match. This was probably the best match of the card. Um, very, like, Mysterio did all the high-flying stuff, but he could go on the mat with Malenko, so it was best of both worlds. The one thing I do have to complain about in this match is just Rey Mysterio's size in himself. He just looked like a small boy was in there. And he was doing all the, all the moves, and he did look all flashy and wonderful, and you know, the technique was spot on. But he just looked like a small boy, and I was like, why... As a 22 year old, I want to watch someone who looks like a 14 year old. Nothing against Rey Mysterio, he's a brilliant worker, he's just. That's the mindset of me as a wrestling fan that I don't really want to watch a really small guy now. He's he's muscled up a little bit and he's looking a lot better nowadays in WWE than he did back then, but. That mate, that was just one thing that I was just like, hmm, I wouldn't put him in a cruiserweight title match. I'd have him in the division, but uh, as he's looking so small, I just. He just looks like he's going to break any time, and he just looks uncomfortable watching him, to be honest. Um, yeah, Malenko got the win, successfully defended the Cruiserweight titles. Best part of the match was um, Mysterio did some sort of, I can't remember how he did it, in all honesty. But he did some sort of flip to the outside, which was like, I remember at the time thinking, wow, that was really good. I think it was the sort of thing where he was like even fa wasn't even facing the guy, he was just like, launched himself backwards and onto him. I think, I think that's how it happened. Um... <sighs> Might be rubbish for certain spots. Um, next up, we had John Tenter versus Big Bubba Rogers. Now, John Tenter had been the shark in Dungeon of Doom, and Big Bubba Rogers was now in the Dungeon of Doom. And Tenter, aka Shark, had turned the back on them. So Big Bubba Rogers had attacked Tenter, shaved half of his head. Then in the next episode of uh, Nitro, Tenter comes down and he says, "Right, you shave my head." Do you know what? I'm not going to shave it. I'm not going to shave the rest of it. I'm going to leave this other half because it reminds me every time I look in the mirror that you did this to me and I'm going to get my revenge at the Great American Bash. <coughs> and he did. He got the win. It was a very boring match. Two big men who, you know, both limited in the ring. Both can tell a story, but when it's two big men trying to tell a story with each other, it, doesn't, it generally doesn't work and it didn't really work here. Um... You know, sadly both of these are not with us anymore. I, I respect both their inputs to the business. I really used to like uh, Big Boss Man when I was a kid. But, um, aka okay, Big Bubba Rogers. I'm mumbling off on words because there's too many Bs. Big Boss Man, Big Bubba Rogers. Uh. But yeah, John Tenter got the win and then he shaved bits of um, Boss Man's beard afterwards and then that was that. Next up, Kevin Sullivan versus Chris Benoit in a false count anywhere match. Now, this is a very famous match. Because at the time, um, what, she, what was she called? Nancy Sullivan, who was Kevin Sullivan's wife, had left him for Chris Benoit. And at that same time, they were feuding on screen as well as this personal issue off screen. Now, did Ben put them in a false count anywhere match where they could just, it was basically a hardcore match? And I really respect both men for in the, throughout this entire match how they were sort of snug with each other but they didn't really t it didn't look like anyway that they took liberties and like having watched shoot interviews on this they like i think sullivan said that they didn't take liberties with each other and that's like really nice to see that these guys could be like really professional and put on such a good match dusty Rhodes in this absolutely annoyed the hell out of me now this is a good match this is a good false count anywhere match it's like really famous as well with all the backstory it's really entertaining watching it but Dusty Rhodes, at one point they go into the men's bathroom and then they're slamming doors into each other. And Dusty Rhodes just out on and goes, Oh my god, oh my god. And I'm like, What's he going to call? What's he going to call? And he's like, There's a woman in the men's bathroom. And I'm like, Seriously? There's, there's this action here with all this backstory and you're going to choose to talk about some woman just standing in the men's toilets when all the all the fans had rushed in to see because all the fans from in the arena had been watching it on the big screen and thought, You know what? I'm just going to go check if they're in our toilet here. Ran in, checked them in the toilet, and then when they were in there, they were all there piling in. Doug Dillinger was uh, holding them all back. And yeah, I can't believe that Dusty Rhodes was just spending time calling this. And then afterwards, uh, Kevin Sullivan picked up a, like a bunch of toilet papers and hit uh, Benoit with them. It made sense just because like it was it was there and it was sort of like oh they're hitting each other with everything they can find. And it would have made sense if Dusty Rhodes mentioned that in that context, but he didn't. He said, "Oh my God, he's hitting him with the toilet paper," as if that was like a really harsh move. And it's like, oh, Dusty, don't sell it like that. Sell it properly. And even me as like a fan could say that. And Dusty's supposed to be a great man for the business. No, I'm not saying he's not. Just a, in, in, on commentary, he's just awful in my opinion. Um, so yeah, Benoit got the win over Sullivan after like a back body suplex. And also at the time, Arn Anderson, 
who was a member of the Four Horsemen with Chris Benoit, even though they only had three members, Anderson, Benoit and Flair. Um, he'd been he'd been cutting a deal with Kevin Sullivan, so nobody knew where and Anderson was going to side. Then after the match, Benoit was pounding Sullivan on the mat, and then Anderson comes down and grabs hold of Benoit and throws him off, and then they both start to attack Sullivan, so it was like a sort of fake out pulling him off, and then yeah, they both attacked Sullivan. Sullivan was furious afterwards. And then we had Sting beating Lord Stephen Regal in a good match. This was a good match. Um, remember one spot in particular that caught my eye was a back body drop on the outside that looked quite high that Regal took. Um, the match, even though the match was good, the backstory was stupid. And when I leaned up to it, I was like, as if this is like getting so, so high on the card. The backstory was on Saturday night's main event or whatever they called, or Saturday night worldwide, whatever the WCW Saturday night show was called. Basically, William Regal, Stephen Regal, Lord Stephen Regal, um, backhanded Sting. So Sting was pissed off, and then Sting came down during the Regal match and backhanded him, and then they were having a match because they backhanded each other and it was like oh, this isn't really a blood feud this is just like oh, I'm slightly aggravated with you so I'm going to fight you you know I'm going to beat you but yeah it was a good match Sting got the win but the backstory was just a bit silly um, oh, I've missed it off on off here but um, there's a tag team match which mainly this was like the main event of the show because this is what all the build up was all about it was about Ric Flair and Ann Anderson going up against Steve Mongo McMichael and Kevin Green who were two NFL footballers at the time there's also a subplot, well, that basically this match was the subplot. The main storyline going on at the moment was Ric Flair versus Macho Man Randy Savage. At the time, Savage and Elizabeth had broken up in real life and on, on screen. On screen, Elizabeth was now with Ric Flair, and she was getting all these alimony checks off Savage, ruining him, making him broke, and then giving all the money to Flair, and then using it as a member of the Four Horsemen to fuel their needs. I think this was like used at the time because I think one of the big stories at the time was um, Donald Trump and Ivana Trump. Was it Ivana Trump had broken up at the time and she'd taken him for a lot, or maybe she tried to and he had a prenup. But I remember it was big news back then that they they divorced, and um, these basically these multi-million divorces were like big in the news at the time. So that's why they did the thing with Elizabeth and Randy Savage where oh she's milking him for all he's got with this alimony, and um, so yeah. During that, you had Nancy Sullivan, who was a member of the Four Horsemen because she was with Benoit, and Elizabeth, both in the corner of Flair and Anderson. And then you had Tara Green, who was Kevin Green's wife, I think that's what she was called, and Deborah McMichael, who was in the WWE later on as Deborah. Who managed Steve Austin later on. But yeah, basically, those two were the wives of Mongo McMichael and Kevin Green, so they were in their corner. Basically, halfway through the match, Nancy Sullivan and Elizabeth chase off the footballers' wives, and then just at the end of the match, Deborah McMichael comes down wearing a, a brand new dress. She wasn't wearing the dress when she went out before. She was wearing like a football jacket. She comes out in this brand new dress with this briefcase, this Halliburton briefcase full of cash, and she presents it to her husband, Mongo McMichael. And then Mongo McMichael grabs it, looks at it, and goes, "Wow!" Closes it smashes his tag team partner Kevin Green over the head with it and that was the end of the match I wasn't really paying attention to it I think, I don't know if it was a pinfall or a submission or a figure fall leg lock or what actually ended the match but I remember that that was the basically that's what it was all building up to that Kevin, um, not Kevin Mongo McMichael was now joining the Four Horsemen Um, what's next on here yeah, oh then we had uh, Eric Bischoff basically come down and say right you two, talking about Kevin Nash and uh, Scott Hall, who'd been in, you two have been invading. You want war? We're going to give you a war. Next month for the Great American Bash, you say you've got a third person. Well, I'll tell you what. We're going to get our best three guys. We're going to do a lottery tomorrow night. We're going to get three guys out at random from our top six contenders, and they're going to face you next month at the Bash at the Beach 1996. But one thing first of all, are you two working for the WWF and uh, Kevin Nash? Oh, Scott Hall, one of them just pipes up and says, no, we're not. That was, um, they had to do that because at the time, Vince McMahon said that it, he, would, he was going to sue the WCW for portraying Nash and Hall like they were working for the WWF. Because when the outsiders came in, they were like, you know where we're from, you know who we are, but you don't know why we're here. And it was sort of like, oh, yeah, these guys from the WWF and they're invading WCW. And it was really exciting at the time because these were the top two companies. Imagine... 
uh, who, I can't even think who two relevant guys would be. Uh, imagine Big like Big Show and who else? Big Show and I can't even think of who's, who's big in WWE right now. Big Show and John Morrison. Imagine Big Show and John Morrison turning up on TNA and saying, "You know who you know who we are." Imagine how exciting that would be. Like, wow, these two megastars from WWF are coming over to WCW. Not that uh, Big Show and Morrison are anywhere near the level that Nash and Hall were. Well, Hall was a lot better than Morrison, but Big Show was a lot better than Nash. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. But yeah, it was really exciting at the time. So they agreed that. But then they said, oh, we're not going to tell you who the three guys are yet. So then Hall and Nash got pissed off and they Hall hit Bischoff, Nash threw him, powerbombed him through the stage. Dusty Rhodes said it was a table. I remember it being a stage, and I remember when I was watching, I lo it looked like the stage to me. So I don't know if Dusty Rhodes just got it wrong or what, but it looked very weak the way he put him through because that part of the stage just went totally, like, just collapsed straight away. And it was like, yeah, this bit of the stage was definitely just set up for that because what else is that bit of stage good for at the moment? Nothing. Right, after that, Lex Luger walks down. He's just getting his title match against. Uh, the giant. It was quite interesting at the time that Luger had the television title and one of the tag team titles. So we had two titles coming down to the ring, ready to go up in this world title match. So we could get three titles, and the giant comes down, and he, it's a one-on-one -on -one match for the world title. And it was a pretty boring match. The only thing not worthy to say is that at one point the giant was lined across the top rope. So Luger goes over, picks him up, tries to get him in the torch rack, and falls over. It was a planned fall over, but Big Show like sort of fell. Well, Luger fell flat on his face and Big Shot was on top of him, so he sort of fell on top of the back of his head as Luger fell, fell flat on his face and it was just a horrible bump. Giant got the win. All in all, this was probably the best WCW pay-per-view I've ever seen. I've only seen about 5-10 of them. I saw a lot from 98, but I was in poor quality. I've seen a few from the later times and to be honest, none of them were as good as this. Actually, I've seen a few from before this as well, but this is the best one I've ever seen. But just because of all the storylines involved in me remembering the storylines and this, this being really nostalgic for me, um, I highly recommend if anyone can get hold of WCW's Great American Bash 1996, watching it, especially for the um, you got the Sting Regal match, which is good of good quality, Benoit Rey Mysterio match, which is good quality, the Steiners are good good in their match, but it's not a good match. Uh, Conan versus Al Gat also a good match, and then you've got the Sullivan Benoit storyline going on. You've got Flair and Anderson storyline with Mongo McMichael which is very interesting and I've got to say this Kevin Green and Mongo McMichael did excellently in that match to carry their carry their part as, be as best they could they did a lot better than guys like Michael McGillicuddy and David Otunga doing their tag team matches nowadays and they're, put, they're trained wrestlers whereas these two are just two American footballers who've had a little bit of training and then gone into wrestling so yeah very interesting um, yeah I'd highly recommend people watch this show if they are interested in WCW and yeah, with that, I'm out. If you want more WCW review shows, please comment down here. If not, um, still comment down here. Uh, have you seen the show? What did you think of the show? What do you think of my review? Um, yeah, with that, I guess I'm out. Please hit the subscribe button if you want to continue watching my videos. And yeah, that's all i got to say, really. From up or from down down here as well. See you later.